I used to think that my fascination with heads was simply uh, just a fascina fascination with horror, but it's actually a completely different fascination with something uh, a little more um, rooted with uh, growing up in Laporte, Indiana. Around seven years old, we moved into town, and there was a museum that was uh, close by. It was in the basement of the courthouse, and we could just walk there or ride our bike there to look at the collections. There was a huge gun collection. There were certain fossils, and all of a sudden there was this Bell Gunnis collection in the one room, and it was run by an old lady. The, the curator was an old lady. Some seven or eight-year-old boy going to this Bell Gunnis, the infamous murderess, collection and there was photographs on display of three particular images uh, of a severed head, uh, body parts of a man in, a, in his burial pit, and a photograph of him when he was alive. And so I was haunted by that because it wasn't clear to recognize that that was the person in the photograph so I'd spent a lot of time trying to understand if that was the person, if I could see that person in that decomposed head. This woman, this murderess in my hometown a hundred years ago, would kill people for their money. And so there could be 40 people that she did this to. They assumed there were about 40 people. They didn't dig up all the graves, but she would sever their bodies and bury them in the hog pit in various places and um, uh, from seven to ten years old I would just routinely go there and I was fascinated with it. I have completely forgotten about that until very recently when I was Google searching the term decomposing head. The only real decomposing head I found on that Google search was images from my hometown museum. and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I hadn't seen him since I was a kid. And it registered uh, like uh, an icon, like you would have seen any image or logo in your life. This was an image that I instantly recognized and forgot about. And I had to assume uh, that this is what set me on my fascination with heads. Not just horror, but with uh, heads for my whole life. This particular piece is a composite of those three photos that I saw in that museum basement. Composite of the photo of the man alive, the photo in the pit, and a photo of the man uh, post-autopsy, the man's head at post-autopsy just on a table. So it's, it's a bit of uh, all three of those images. My fascination with the human head came from that very experience, and not just the human head, but with uh, museum display work. The other, the other great thing about Laporte, or the other historical thing, that's not such a great thing. That's a, that's, they celebrate it, but it, it's a horror. But the great thing about Laporte is that Isamu Noguchi, a 20th century giant in sculpture, I mean, one of the great sculptors of all time, certainly one of the top five in the 20th century, graduated from my high school. He spent four years in Laporte. When I googled or searched his name on the website, nothing came up. The only thing that that museum celebrates is the murderess that came from the town. They don't celebrate the fact that we graduated one of the great sculptors of all time. Horror comic books were really a big uh, interest for me too. And I was lucky from when I was uh, 13, I went to this our old magazine shop, and the one who, woman who ran it, uh, she had white hair, horn rim glasses, black sweater, always, and um, she had these old magazine racks. And I just thought to uh, reach back and see what might have fallen back there. Sure enough, I pulled a comic book from 1948, and I showed it to her. I said, I'll clean those from behind the magazine racks for you if I can have them. She goes, I'll sell you everything for 10 cents each. And I said, all right. So I grabbed up about 300 comics and I took these home. 
I took him on the bus and I took him home and my mom kind of flipped out and told me to take him back right away. She didn't want me to be looking at stuff like that. So, um, you know, images like that, I'd have to, I'd have to have when I was a kid. You know, it's all about the head. I mean, that is perfect. There's, I don't know any magazine that does that anymore. But those are some of the greatest uh, influences on my work. And uh, that's kind of a taboo thing to say, I think, in the fine arts culture, because uh, pop culture is low culture. Um, it would be a lot more pre prestigious to say that I've always been influenced by Rodin, Michelangelo, Picasso. Uh, I've been lucky to be exposed to those people from when I was a kid, but you'd never say those were as fun as uh, something like this. So uh, for me to discover this at that time period when you wouldn't find a comic like that, I was really lucky. Well, it depends on how you look at it, but I feel privileged to be to have experienced that part of comic books history. It was a real special experience, and um, those comics are classics. They're highly sought after, and they give me they give me a lot of joy. thought that Ted Williams was a great legend and the first baseball bat I got was a Sears Roebuck Ted Williams model back when I was you know eight years old third grade I guess so that was when I learned about Ted Williams uh, I asked who is Ted Williams and somebody told me he's the greatest hitter of all time so when he he died that was quite a loss uh, He's one of the people that you'd like to have met along the way. But the story of him being frozen and then come to find out that his head was severed, I just don't see how in any way, shape, or form that could be an acceptable thing to do. I, I just couldn't believe it. I knew right then and there I had to do of work based on that, but it's certainly not meant to be disrespectful to Ted Williams. It's, it is a horror story. To have his head severed, that is a horror story. Um, I think even in death to have your head severed, it just, it doesn't settle very well. I think we were all kind of fascinated by it. The media certainly was fascinated by it. And the story that went with it was that it was a ghastly sight that there were hairline fractures and holes drilled in because of the process of freezing the head. But his head's still there in some storage tank, cylinder, stainless steel cylinder in the middle of Arizona. And I don't think that story could ever really go away. Contemporary pop culture is exactly like this. Every TV show, CSI, uh, Law and Order, all those TV shows, this is exactly it. Everybody that I thought wasn't interested in severed heads all of a sudden is very interested in severed heads. So all of a sudden my work isn't so much about pop culture, but it's about the general audience's fascination with the severed head. So it kind of fits in there. So it's a, it's a perfect time for me to really kind of go back into my early inspiration.